in which we think that tracking flexibility uh, can allow people to better connect tracking to different uh, values and interests that they have. Uh, and then in the second line of work, I'm going to talk about how I think that we can improve uh, highlighting the significance of moments that people are tracking through different styles of tracking annotations. Um, and this is mostly in social settings. Uh, but before I, I go and I, I talk uh, more about this work. Uh, one thing that I want to highlight is I want to highlight that my students really led the works that I'm talking about today. Uh, Matthew and John, Whitney, she, Lucas, and Dennis. So, uh, so feel free to. I'm, I'm more than happy to connect you with any of them. They can certainly speak more eloquently about the different projects that they worked on than I can. Um, and I also want to highlight that uh, a couple of the projects that I'm, I'm presenting on today are things that are in progress or things that we're just starting to think about or that are under submission. And I'll try to flag those uh, before I talk about them. So take those particular projects with a grain of salt as appropriate. Okay. Um, so let me start by, by trying to uh, define meaning um, when it comes to tracking technology. And then, and then I'll start to talk through some projects where I think uh, we can design more meaningful tracking tools. Okay, uh, so this so this comes from a, a literature review that we did of the self tracking literature, um, where we where we just did a systematic review. We tried to understand what are the different topics and what are the different motivations for tracking that people tend to uh, tend to to study in the research literature. And one of the big findings that we had is that the research literature is, has focused a lot on behavior change as kind of a main goal of personal tracking. And this makes sense. Um, this is certainly a lot of a main reason why people turn to tracking uh, for things like increasing physical activity, eating more balanced meals, reducing unnecessary spending, uh, and, and a variety of other different goals. Um, but if we kind of turn this around, there's actually a long tail of other reasons why people turn to tracking technology and a lot of other motivations that they have. And these motivations are kind of often alongside their motivations for behavior change. Um, but people are also turning to tracking technology with the hope that it will help them with social connection, with bonding with one another, maybe with or through data. Uh, curiosity, using data to kind of answer questions that they have about themselves or about their habits. Uh, having a record, record keeping, um, just kind of recording data that they hope to, to use later on, maybe or something like that. Uh, and then creative self-expression, actually using data as part of artistic practices uh, in order to, to share or communicate things with others. Um, and that's not to say that goals like behavior change or chronic condition management aren't also important. Um, but, but I think that there's really a better opportunity to, to kind of support those goals by also simultaneously supporting some of these other goals like personal connection or, or satisfying curiosity. Um, and, and if we, if we want to achieve this, uh, at a higher level, we need to we need to kind of blend these goals together. Okay, uh, so that was a little bit on some of the motivations that people have for turning to, to, to tracking technology. Uh, what does it mean to actually have a meaningful engagement with a piece of technology in general? Um, so there's been a lot of work over the years that's tried to kind of conceptualize what it means to, to have a meaningful engagement with technology. Uh, this can get pretty theoretical pretty quickly. I'm going to focus on just one model uh, that was suggested by Meckler and Hornbeck. They kind of distilled out meaning and meaningful engagements with technology into these five different principles of connectedness, purpose, coherence, resonance, and significance. Um, and I'll introduce and kind of talk through each of these as, as they come, become relevant to the rest of the talk. Uh, but I think that this is overall a useful framework for thinking of, of, about what actually constitutes a meaningful piece of engagement. Um, and so what I think is that tracking technology has kind of largely done a pretty good job at, at two of these ideas, uh, purpose and coherence. And so now I'm going to kind of walk through what I think that means. Uh, so purpose, the idea of purpose is, is that people find meaning in seeing how their actions contribute towards some sort of overall or some sort of larger goal. And so I think that this is, this is uh, really common. You see this a lot in tracking technology with things like goal setting, monitoring of progress, that sort of thing. Uh, so as, as just one example, your Apple Watch can give you can give you a reminder to stand up once an hour. 
and you can you can see how that's regularly contributing towards a goal that you might set, say standing up for 12 hours over the course of the day. So you see, you in 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 the case of their intervention, you get a notification, uh, you perform the action, and then you can see how that action is then manifesting towards a, a goal that you have at least for that day. Um, and in tracking technology, we certainly think about this at larger time scales too. Um, but there's still this idea of purpose of seeing how your individual actions are contributing towards some goal that you have. Coherence is also uh, largely supported in tracking technology as well. Uh, so coherence is, is this concept, concept that you find meaning through understanding what you're experiencing, understanding what you're going through. Uh, and this is largely the reflection piece of tracking technology, where you see your data, you see it visualized, you see it represented through bar charts or through some other sort of data visualization. Um, this can also come in the forms of planning or hypothesis testing, but you, you get a sense of, of what it is that you're going through, what it is that you're experiencing. Um, and I've done plenty of work in this space. Uh, people here at, at Michigan have also done really great work in this space as well. Uh, and really trying to, to help people better understand their habits through uh, through different representations of data. But what I think is, is potentially missing from these sorts of engagements with tracking technology is some of these other concepts, some of these other ways in which people define meaning. Um, so I'll spend a little bit more time on these as they become relevant, but, but just to give kind of an overview and a quick definition, the other three concepts of meaning as, as, as defined by this framework are people find meaning in relating their experiences to other values and interests that they have. People find meaning in feeling that what they're doing is important, and then people find meaning in, in kind of the everyday joys and wonders that they go about experiencing. Uh, so as I, as I transition over to some of my work, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on this first one. I'm going to focus on uh, how I think that we can better connect to values uh, that people have through uh, through tracking of life situations. Okay, so as I just said, connectedness is this idea that people find meaning in relating their experiences to other values or interests that they have. Uh, so maybe this is hobbies that they have, maybe this is uh, 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 religion or, or, or other sort of avenues or aspects of their lives, uh, but how, how can we actually go about relating that to uh, what it is that people are tracking? And certainly people do this through kind of directly tracking those sorts of behaviors through maybe tracking uh, what board games they're playing or what music that they're listening to. But I think that there are also potentially other ways of doing that, which can kind of also help reinforce those behavioral principles that, that often motivate people to start tracking in the first place. Um, and I think overall, uh, we can approach this in design by giving people the flexibility to track what they want uh, and express how that relates to their other interests. Okay, so now I'm going to talk through two projects where, where I uh, connect tracking to different values and interests that people have. Uh, I'm going to talk through uh, one project which is really about flexibility and presentation and in giving people the flexibility to decide for themselves how they go about presenting their track data. Uh, and then flexibility and collection where people have the ability to choose what data they want to collect at a particular time. Okay. Um, so representations of track data have often been fairly static. They've often been fairly fixed. Um, there's this idea that if we if we only visualize just the right thing, if we present someone a visualization which reflects their goal, which uh, which gives them some useful insight, that'll be the thing that we can deliver that'll provide them the most value. Uh, so certainly, I, I did this in some of my early work. Um, Apple Watch or, or Apple Health does this in trying to trying to present. Uh, representations of your data by highlighting how much you're walking more this month than, than in other months. It's really trying to highlight here uh, some potentially useful insight that you might glean from this sort of data. Um, but today's tracking, tool has, tracking tools have substantially greater degrees of freedom in how they actually go about representing data. Uh, we're not as constrained to these bar graphs or these other visualizations that, that we, we often traditionally saw. Um, but if we think about other contexts where people are tracking, like in, in uh, Fitbits or in Apple Watches, uh, there are galleries that exist out there where people can kind of go and design their own custom watch faces and kind of blend this personal data with other interests, with other hobbies that they have. Um, and Fitbit has hundreds of these to choose from. They all include data as a core part of them. Uh, you can see even in this, this cat one that there's, uh, there's data kind of in the corners of it. Comics one, same thing. They're all kind of blending that data in with other aspects of those representations. 
Um, so this, this led us to really understand, uh, to really want to understand how people actually choose to represent their track data when given kind of open-ended flexibility to do that. When they're not constrained by, by bar graphs, they're not necessarily constrained, constrained by trying to uh, draw the most insight from their data. What is it that they actually want to present? What is it that they're, how is it that they're actually representing their data? Um, so we saw three different styles of, of kind of customizations that people tended to, to perform. Um, so I'm going to start by focusing on database representation. So this is kind of what you would expect that people would decide what metrics are most important to them. Um, they would they would care about what how how to kind of manipulate those metrics in ways which were important. So maybe it's not the step totals, but uh, in the bottom right here, this person wants to know how many steps they're walking per hour. Um, well, some people wanted more data, some people wanted less data, um, but people people are often tailoring those sorts of needs. Second category of customizations that we saw was much more aesthetic based. Uh, and, and this, uh, particularly coming from a designer and HCI background, you might expect this as well. People have uh, personalizations around color, fonts, that sort of thing, layouts, uh, in order to make their watch face more glanceable, um, that sort of thing. But what we found is that is that these these customizations actually led people to, to kind of be more interested in the act of tracking as well. They they felt kind of greater personal attachment to ones where they actually chose the colors and designs for themselves. Uh, and kind of the third category that we saw is people doing much more personal, uh, uh, designing much more personal uh, connections with their actual smartwatches. Uh, so people would choose cartoon characters that they liked, they put up pictures of their kids, causes that they supported, uh, political messages, and they would actually make that into the design of their, their watches. They would select watch faces that kind of highlighted some of those personal values or, or other personal meanings. Um, and, and what we see through this is that people, first off, people derive a lot of joy from being able to customize their watch faces and being able to personalize them to their interests. Uh, so for example, S140 on the top here is saying that not only does it have the stats, uh, uh, not only can the stats be customized, but I was able to pick what I want to be each color. Uh, so she really appreciated being able to have that flexibility. Uh, and then and then S173 on the bottom here is saying that the that she loves this watch face, it fits with her tattoos, she might update it if she gets new ones. Um, so what so she's actually really connecting the the watch face to other aspects of how she presents herself to the world um, through through her tattoos. And other people did this in similar ways by trying to customize their watch faces to the clothes that they were wearing in that particular day. And they would actually swap out their watch faces fairly often as they they uh, changed outfits or found themselves in social settings, like maybe they have a watch face for home or a watch face for being out on a date. Um, and people would really see this uh, 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 kind of mirrored in how they they went about their daily lives. Um, but moreover, what we ended up finding is that uh, these personal customizations then actually drove interest and motivation and actually being active. Uh, so in this example on the top, this participant is saying, seeing my grandchildren on my watch face helps me get up and move. Seeing them makes me move a little bit more and make myself stronger so that I can spend more time with them. It's like a persistent reminder to try to get up. Uh, so this isn't necessarily something that you would see if you were just visualizing the data on their own, but having that kind of family tie was then, was then a piece of encouragement to go and to actually be more active. Um, and we actually saw similar sorts of things. This didn't just have to be family connections, um, but this participant on the bottom was a big Spider-Man fan, um, and that really helped them enjoy their Fitbit a lot. Sometimes they even feel a bit heroic when they get really active. So it's not, it doesn't just have to be about family connections. It can be just really connecting to any sorts of interests or values that people have. So those are some of the, the main conclusions that we drew from that project. All right, gonna, gonna transition over a little bit to, to flexibility in, in collection of data. Um, so this is this is from uh, an app we built called Mahi. This is in the domain of food journaling. Um, so, so if you don't know much about food journaling, there's been a lot of research on both qualitative and quantitative data collection in food journaling. So calorie counting as well as kind of photo-based food journaling. Um, so on the left, you see my plate is kind of a traditional calorie-based app. Uh, where you can go and, and uh, log the caloric intake and vitamins and, and other sorts of nutrients that show up in basically any food that you have. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, you often see kind of open-ended logs like eight, 
where you might just snap a photo of your food, but it's very much intention. Uh, the intention is very much not to have that kind of numeric, uh, often judgment that comes along with journaling. Um, but what these what these apps are doing, uh, and, and this has been shown both in, in research and in, in commercial spaces, um, food journaling can be helpful for both open-ended awareness and dietary monitoring for goals like weight loss and, and uh, management of chronic conditions, but apps have kind of largely fallen into one of these two spectrums. But what happens here is these systems are then setting up a dichotomy where, where you kind of have to choose between either a qualitative or a quantitative goal. You have to either choose whether or not you want this calorie log or whether you want the, the flexibility to just take a photo of your food and not have that log at all. Um, but, but what I think is that people people's needs actually are much more situational. They have times when they might want one, they have times when they might want another. Um, and so that led us to develop Mahdi, which was a, a food journaling app where people could choose any time that they went to journal which among these different entry mechanisms they thought would be most useful to them at that moment. So they could choose, for example, to do a calorie-based journal for one entry. Um, on the next entry, they could switch to a photo, or they could do an entry that had both of those together. Um, we also had other sorts of inputs like barcodes, for example, or open-ended text descriptions. Uh, so people could kind of mix and match based on uh, what they were experiencing. And kind of the core idea behind this is that uh, letting people situationally choose what inputs they were using can kind of help them collect data, which is most meaningful at that time. So when we went about deploying money, what we ended up finding is that people's, uh, the, the journaling strategies which people used were still actually fairly largely motivated by the goals that they originally had when they started. Uh, so, for example, people who had awareness goals, who just wanted to be aware of their diet, for example, uh, they tended to use open-ended text descriptions at a much higher rate than participants who had weight loss goals. Uh, while on the flip side, participants with weight loss goals tended to use database searches a lot more. And this kind of makes sense. This follows, this follows with what you might think about uh, when you think about how people are, are making these sorts of decisions. Um, when someone is tracking for a goal of weight loss, they often probably want that detailed caloric record, and so they're, they're perhaps more likely to use a database search. And then on the flip side, someone who's tracking for more awareness goals might want that open-ended flexibility to describe food and however they want to. But when we look at the times when they, they deviate and the ways in which they actually went about using those different features, uh, we found some times where people uh, created other forms of meaning, where people uh, actually connected what they were tracking to other goals that they had. So, for example, we see things like social values, uh, where in, in this first example, P5 is logging via an open-ended text field. Uh, he's highlighting dinner at a friend's house, barbecue chicken with mac and cheese. So in addition to highlighting the actual food, uh, he's actually including some of this other contextual information because he wants that's, that's something that he thinks is important to put in his blog. Uh, that's something that he wants to make sure to remember as he goes back and uses this log for, for other goals, as well as, as calorie monitoring. Uh, we also see shifting values, where people, over the course of the study, people's values and, and interests will kind of shift uh, between uh, different goals that they might have. Uh, so P13 is saying here, I'm just trying to be cognizant of what I'm eating. I would be fine with a simpler tracking version. If I'm going to be doing my, my weight training, then I'm going to want something more granular. And so P13 would actually kind of switch back and forth as they went through the study based on, on what, uh, what was most meaningful and what was most important for them to collect at a given moment. Uh, and kind of finally, this, this aligns also somewhat social values um, that people also uh, thought about how they might use this journal as part of self-presentation. Uh, so P7 is saying here, I didn't want to list all the foods I, I was consuming. Uh, plus, I thought that the presentation looked nice. So as part of, of food journaling with a photo, uh, this participant was actually thinking about uh, both, the, both the quality of the log as something that they could, they, they could go back to and derive enjoyment from, as well as for uh, awareness goals. Um, and we found other people who would kind of do these together, where they do a calorie log and then they also collect a photo so that they could have that nice looking representation for them to go back to and for them to look at, look at alongside it. So what I take away from these lines of work is that um, 
I think that greater flexibility in how we go about collecting data and how we go about representing data can allow people to decide for themselves how they want to relate tracking to their, their other interests and their values. Um, so giving people the flexibility to, uh, to present their data in light of, of other contexts can allow people to decide for themselves uh, other, other aspects and other interests that they want to, to highlight alongside their data. And then in collection, they can it allows people to collect data that's kind of most relevant to their goals and their interests at a particular moment. Um, but one thing that I think is, is an important space that we need to spend more time looking at is how do we can design tools to better support these kinds of flexibility. Uh, so certainly through Madi, we did some of this a little bit. I think there were still some, some failings of the system uh, that we could have supported more. Um, one conversation that I had this morning is that we, we haven't uh, done effective jobs at how we can summarize this sort of data if we if we have kind of open-ended and really flexible journals. Um, how would we go about summarizing that longitudinally, for example? Um, but in general, I think that, that we would benefit from better tools and to, to support these kinds of flexible entry and flexible journals. All right. Okay. Um, so in in this the second part of what I'm going to present here, uh, I'm going to talk about how I think that we can convey the significance of tracking through through different types of tracking annotations. Um, and I'll talk through two different projects where I think that we've done some of this in in Snappy and in Gcotty. Uh, so going back to the definition, significance is, is this idea that people find meaning and, and feeling that their actions are important. And when this comes in the context of tracking, people often kind of know that inherently, or people kind of have some of that sense inherently. Uh, their actions, like maybe walking more or listening to music that they like, they have somewhat of an inherent sense that that's important to them. Um, but what often is, is challenging in this space is actually then communicating uh, why they that they find it important and why they find that important to other people. So I know for myself that exercising is something that I really care about. I know that this is a music artist that I really like listening to, for example. Uh, you might not know that about me. You might not uh, appreciate it in quite the same way that I might appreciate it. Um, and this this happens both in social settings and, and I think as well as in, in clinical settings where the, the experiences and the data that I think are particularly important uh, might not resonate with you. And so what I think that we can do better is designs can assist people in kind of communicating the significance uh, by, by conveying that importance through annotation. So I think we can do more annotation of data and with data. Uh, and, and that's what I'll talk about in these last two projects. Uh, so first I'm gonna talk about annotation through data with the idea of getting social feedback and social support. And then I'll talk through annotation of data for, for clinical benefit and clinical value. Okay, uh, so I'm going to start in the in the social space and the social media space, which I expect will resonate with a lot of this audience next as well. Uh, people often turn to social media to share the different things that they did, the different experiences that they had, that sort of thing. They do so to get support around things that were hard, to celebrate things that were successful, to share insights that they learned, get advice. Uh, there's a lot of different goals for this, um, and this sort of engagement can also have then longer term health benefits uh, around well being by giving people the, the support that they need to continue to practice healthy behaviors. Uh, I, won't, I won't go into all of this conceptual model. This is a conceptual model that we built about the relationship between tracking technology and kind of largely social technology like social media. Um, one, I'll, I'll highlight that one of the things that, that we found here is that when things go well, people transfer the, the data that they collected from tracking technology to the social settings uh, in order to get support, share insights, that sort of thing. And then they mostly translate knowledge back. So they mostly uh, apply things like uh, getting routes that, that they might want to run or walk, uh, get ideas for foods that they could prepare, that sort of thing. And then they go and, and they might either track those things or look up how they could actually go in and collect more of that sort of data um, back into the tracking tool. Um, and this is kind of idealistic. What happens in reality is that when people go and they share these, share these sorts of moments, people are worried uh, that their tracked insights, their self-reported moments, that sort of thing, uh, are, are often too trivial to share. Uh, and and this, a, a, a lot of the sort of findings that happened uh, have came out of work that, that happened here at Michigan, 
uh, as well as in other papers. Uh, and this is kind of a, a repeated finding that has shown up in the literature. Um, in reality, these moments often tend not to get the kind of support that, that people desire. So when people share something like this image on the right, where someone's taking a photo of their feet and that they went running, people often tend not to get as much response or, or the kinds of responses that they actually go and, and they actually desire. Um, and so one of the things that, that one of the projects that I did in this space to, to try to help people kind of get more of the kinds of support that they wanted um, came out of this, came into this project called Snappy, where Snappy was an extension on top of Snapchat, where what you would do is you could have essentially a, a database sticker. So you could configure a, a sticker that would go on top of the snap that you would typically send. Um, and it would highlight maybe something about your physical activity, maybe something about your heart rate, uh, how much time you've spent on an activity. We had a variety of different data domains within that. But the, the important piece, there were, there, were, there were actually kind of two important pieces into the design of Snappy. Uh, one was the use of ephemeral social media. So uh, by using Snapchat and by using kind of messages uh, on that platform, we thought, uh, and, and literature has backed this up, that this would be more useful for, for sharing kind of more everyday or smaller moments that people have throughout their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, the second principle is that track data was actually a fairly small piece of the snaps that people were actually sending. Uh, it was an annotation, it was, it was a layer on top of the content that they were sending, but people would kind of use the features within Snapchat to better describe and better convey the importance of their data. So they would take a photo of something meaningful and then kind of describe it um, or use the sticker to add additional context. They would use captions to explain the importance of that data. Uh, and so they would, they would use the features that were kind of built into the platform to elaborate on that further. Um, I need to stop sharing for just a second. Uh -huh. Okay. 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 We get on audio. Okay. We'll see if I'm able to, to hear the get the audio from the video that I'm about to play. variety of stickers to select from. The audio. After picking the sticker, the sticker could then be customized with options available to it. For the sneaker-shaped step sticker, the animation and target goal could be customized. Oh, no. For the badge sticker, color and animation were available to be customized. Snappy user could customize what data they would like to include for sharing. Snappy syncs with existing data sources for most of the domains. For example, steps data could be pulled from the iOS health kit. User could then select the time interval by selecting the time range from day, week, or months, and then select the window of the activity they wish to share. Share could customize the sticker as much as they like. After rendering complete, Snappy user could export the sticker to Snapchat. They could then take a photo shot and customize the snaps with Snapchat's built-in authoring features, such as adding stickers or captions. So one thing that I'll highlight here is that methodologically, this ended up being really useful because we could kind of leverage built-in mechanics that were already within Snapchat. We could use their stickers, we could use the ability to take photos, add captions, that sort of thing. And we didn't have to build any of those pieces from scratch, uh, as well as people were already communicating uh, with their, their contacts that they already have on Snapchat. So, so from a study perspective, it ended up kind of simplifying a lot of our process. Uh, and what we found that when people use the app is that people use the stickers in all sorts of playful ways and found them to be really helpful and useful uh, conversation starters. Uh, so people would kind of combine them with other other stickers and other things that they would have. 
Uh, one finding that, that I always think is really interesting is um, I'm not sure quite how apparent it was from the video, uh, but we didn't actually have we didn't actually restrict the data that people were entering. They could journal kind of whatever they want. Uh, and so what people would do is you can see in the example on the right, this person is saying their their heartbeat is 880 beats per minute. If you know anything about heart rate, you would die. If that was <laughs> Uh, but what this person is doing is they're using the sticker, they're actually appropriating the sticker to convey an emotion, to convey just kind of how they're feeling, rather than treating the data as fact, rather than treating the data as, as what they're actually relying on. Um, and so I kind of take away from this that we don't actually need to think about sharing of data as truth necessarily, we don't have to rely on the data as something objective, uh, but there are other playful and, and fun ways in which we can think about data sharing to kind of support people in their, their actual practices. Um, and what we find is that sharing via annotation actually helps people contextualize their data a little bit better. Um, so, so P11 here is saying that she would like to hold her food up over, uh, over a sticker with a bowl, so she's, she's kind of holding a dumpling that she's eating over the sticker itself. Uh, and she thought for those interesting instances, it helped convey some sort of meaning. Um, and so, so what I take away from this is that uh, this helped contextualize why why that data might actually be relevant or why that data might actually be important. And by kind of playfully connecting these two, it kind of enabled her to to kind of tell that story through what she did actually share. Um, and similarly, people also use use these sorts of features in order to convey the importance of data. Uh, so one participant was sharing uh, the number of plays that they listened to of a song by Blackpink. Uh, if you listen to a song over and over again, and before Snappy, it would just be a random screenshot or something, I wouldn't necessarily put captions so that people couldn't tell how much I like that song. So the data actually was, was a way to kind of deepen that, uh, that knowledge, deepen that understanding, rather than if she had just posted a picture of the artist, for example, or just said in written text how much she, she liked that particular artist. It added a little bit of proof to, uh, to what she was sharing. Okay, um, so, so that's how I think data can be helpful as kind of the source of annotation. Um, and in this last project, uh, I'm not gonna spend quite as long in this last phase. Uh, I think that there's also opportunity when, when we're thinking about sharing data to actually annotate that data in order to convey some of the significance of it a little bit better. Uh, and this is really in medical settings that, I'm, that I'm, I've been at least thinking about it in my work. Um, so so uh, in medical settings, there's been a rise of technology for patient monitoring, where passive diagnostics and different journaling techniques are kind of widely being put into practice. Uh, but a core challenge of this sort of work is that patients often want to convey aspects of their experiences, which data doesn't actually doing a, do a good job of capturing. You know, or if you read the data too literally, you might not get a full sense of that picture. Uh, and um, so people, so, so these data logs are often being brought into clinical settings where patients are collecting this sort of data, but they often have different conversations that they want to go and they want to have with a provider. Uh, and so to give one example on this, we did a project called Geniati, uh, which despite being published for a year, is being presented at CSCW in a couple weeks. Uh, Geniati uh, was, was an app to help parents of young autistic children uh, monitor behaviors that they were having and following procedures to help them understand what might have motivated those behaviors. Uh, Geniati is effectively a digital instantiation of a clinically validated method for helping parents uh, in, in this space. Uh, there's lots of importance and interesting aspects of, the, of how a, a kid might be a little bit more involved, um, but I'm mostly going to focus on how parents interact with it, at least in this context. Um, so what we find, so, so uh, parents would, would kind of journal behaviors that their, that their kids were going through, uh, and then they would go and they would bring it to a review with a, a clinical expert uh, to kind of have a little bit of a conversation around it. Um, and the system actually created a good amount of tension in this space. Uh, and so what he's 15 is saying that E3, who's the, the medical expert in this case, uh, says that there must be uh, some specific reason that, that her kid practice particular behaviors. Uh, but I can't find any, even though I've tried for years. Theoretically, there should be some reason, but the real world doesn't always follow theories. Um, and so what was happening in the case of E15 is she actually thought that there were there were factors which weren't being well recognized by the data that was being collected, and that was the conversation that she wanted to go in and have during a clinical setting. 
But by and large, when the doctors came in in the stage, when the medical experts came in, they'd say things like, uh, when I ask parents how their child has been doing, they often talk about the first thing that comes to their mind or the most difficult time that they've had. But it's much better for me to just walk through the data through each guy. So, so the, the clinical providers would then kind of rely on that data as, as an objective source of, of what's actually been experienced. But for, for parents, they often felt like it lacked kind of the experiential uh, aspects of, of what it was like to, to kind of go through and do clinical care. So. Um, and so, and, and so I've, I've been really thinking about this, and I've been thinking about how we can do better in this space. Um, I'm not sure I have the best solutions right now. One thing that I've been thinking about, um, and we're actually taking this idea and applying it in a different medical context, um, but I've been thinking about how we can take these kind of clinical diagnostic logs, uh, like a, a, a medical scale that, that you might use in our context is for how, uh, whether someone has depressive symptoms, um, and how a patient might be able to annotate that to kind of highlight, here are the things that I want you to pay attention to. So providers can kind of still get their clinically validated scales in the space. They can still kind of get that, that clinical data, but patients can kind of steer those conversations towards values that they have and keep the conversations that they have. Um, so we're just starting to do work in this space. We're just starting to do some uh, design activities to test out this idea. Um, but it's one opportunity that at least I'm particularly excited about, and I think is something that's potentially promising moving forward. Uh, so what I take away from these lines of projects is that annotation has the potential to start more nuanced conversations around the significance of data. Uh, so people understand that for themselves, they have some sort of a sense uh, for themselves what's significant. But I think uh, annotating the data, either using the data as the piece of annotation or annotating the data itself, has that potential to kind of deepen that conversation a little bit more. Um, but one question that I have in this space, and one thing that I'm still kind of grappling with, and I'd love to, to get your perspectives on this, um, is if we're doing this in social settings, are we putting too much weight on the artifact itself? Are we putting too much weight on the piece of technology and uh, what's included in that piece of technology to kind of do that hard work of kind of facilitating the conversation? Um, and I don't know, I don't have good answers to that right now, but I'd love to hear your all's perspectives on that. Okay, uh, so as, as I get towards wrapping up, um, I hope that through presenting these research projects, I've given a bit of a sense about how I think flexibility and annotation uh, can lead to more meaningful interactions with tracking technology. Uh, intrepid listeners might know that I left out one form of meaning, uh, resonance. Resonance is that people derive meaning from everyday joys and wonders. Um, I think this is really hard. Um, so the people who came up with the meaning, the meaning framework kind of say that technology doesn't do a particularly good job of this. Uh, and I think that that's largely, if we were to try to call attention to it, if we were to try to point it out, it would kind of drop the, the, the kind of uh, uh, impromptu nature of going and, and kind of deriving meaning from these everyday experiences. So I'm not exactly sure to what extent technology can be effective at drawing these things out, but if I do think that there's some opportunity, uh, and this aligns with some conversations that I've had here today, I think it might be in the family space, uh, where oftentimes what families are, are trying to promote when they introduce these types of technologies isn't actually kind of the rigorous monitoring or goal setting. Sometimes it is, but oftentimes it's trying to instill kind of uh, holistic values that someone might carry forward into adulthood. Uh, so I think that that's maybe a potential opportunity to kind of highlight these everyday experiences, these everyday joys, rather than, than kind of longitudinally uh, uh, One last thing is that I think that there's uh, opportunity to acknowledge and kind of challenge some of the social and cultural influences uh, that end up influencing the meaning that people derive from tracking. So culture actually has a lot of influence on how we go about designing these different tracking tools. Uh, so, for example, we did a study on weight loss uh, and diet monitoring apps in China, and they they really uh, reflect uh, a particular body shape as as this ideal that you should that everyone should be pursuing, and that's the lens in which food journaling is actually talked about. Yeah. Uh, similarly, the design of wearables uh, often emphasize physical activities like walking as opposed to other sorts of physical activities that are commonly performed in trade work which excludes different populations from them, from, from using the wearable and benefiting from the wearable. Uh, and then in ongoing work, we're also starting to, to look at uh, Western pregnancy apps 
uh, geared at fathers to be, and they they tend to promote ignorance. They tend to promote uh, humor around the idea of being a parent rather than focus on participating in the tracking and participating in learning about what fatherhood might look like. So we think that there's uh, I, I think that there's opportunity to kind of push back on some of these uh, cultural norms. Um, and I think I think we need to better understand how they end up getting baked into the design of tracking apps that we're looking at. That's all I have. I'm happy to take questions. I see one on Zoom that I'm going to start with, and I'll give it to you. Let me pull it up. Uh, so Hami is asking, uh, recalling the screenshot showing 880 beats per minute earlier in Sambi. Has there any been any studies on different populations to understand and make use of tracking analytics? And deriving actual insights from them. For example, people who focus a lot on diet may pay atten uh, additional attention on calorie monitoring, but do they necessarily understand the implication that X calories burn because you walk at Y miles as a health concept, other than recognizing that some numbers go up and down? Uh, I wonder if we have that understanding. If, if wondering if having that understanding will motivate that further. Uh, that's a that's a good question. Um, I think there's been. I think there has been some work in this space. Uh, one of the biggest questions that you, that you then have to grapple with is do people have, have an understanding of kind of that end metric? Do people have an understanding of what it actually means to, to try to reduce calories, for example? If walking leads to reduction of calories, do people have a, an idea of what that means? Uh, and so what a lot of the tracking literature has done is they've kind of set up arbitrary, or I shouldn't call it arbitrary, though uh, if you know anything about 10,000 steps and where that metric came from, that's actually an arbitrary metric. It was designed by uh, a business person in Japan who was trying to introduce fitness trackers. Um, so I, so I, think, I think it's kind of in, in setting baselines for people, and I think we need to do more work in, in adjusting those baselines to a bunch of different individuals. Go ahead. Um, uh, when I use tracking uh, apps or other things like it, I don't really care about any information I get that mm -hmm. I had to self-report because I'm both forgetful and sometimes I even lie to myself. Yep. Um, I'm wondering uh, to what extent uh, those uh, data aggregations that are um, impervious to the user uh, filtering or otherwise uh, changing them around uh, would contribute to users actually uh, having more faith in the truth value of the results they're getting back here is very different mythological. So, so is your question, um, so for example, my Fitbit is passively collecting with, without my intervention information about how much I'm walking. Even that, because like if your phone goes out of batteries, it won't record while you're walking with it out of batteries. Right. So, uh, when I installed, for example, uh, step tracking app, mm -hmm. and then I took my dog for a walk, uh, with my phone dead. And I didn't realize my phone was dead. I uninstalled the app the next day because I was like, that might happen again. I might be getting back bad data and not realize it. Um, so the kind of tracking data that I actually value is like bank account statements, um, things like getting into UMich, things that could never have been falsified by me that I couldn't touch. And I can value them a lot more because they're not just meaningful to me, they're meaning meaningful in the scope of the world. Yeah. That's so. That's a good question. Um, and I a lot think, of what you focused on was like personal meeting, but for me, I, and I think a lot of people, personal meeting is underscored by a truth value that you can't argue with. That's okay. That's interesting. Um, I think I would put. I, I I think I would say yes for some goals. Like when you think about you know when you're thinking about step tracking towards behavioral change, for example, that might be that might be a space where kind of broader meaning does matter. Uh, but when I think about what might matter to me, then maybe, maybe that, maybe part of that accuracy does, you can go away and that's okay if it goes away. So, um, I mean, would it be great if data were always accurate all the time? Always? Absolutely. Um, but I think towards some personal meaning goals, it, it, it may not be essential. For it. You don't think it should be a goal of these companies to try to abstract the collection of data away from the self-reporting? Oh, I mean, I, I well, okay. I think there's I think there's downsides to doing that. Um, one of the downsides to doing that is that if you 
if you move too too much towards automation, um, you lose a lot of the the kind of in situ reflectiveness that people have when people are say that again institute reflectiveness in situ. So like every day. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so when people are are collecting the data, they're also thinking about what that means. When they're journaling, they're also thinking about okay, this is you know this is high, this is low, and so they're getting some of that like reflective value through the act of journaling. Um, I do also think that that you're right that you know. Automation has a lot of value. Um, I'll, I'll also point to you know some of the potential societal risks, societal downsides to that, right? Like uh, Fitbit bought, was bought by Google. There's potentially consolidation of these sorts of technologies into you know, the bigger tech sphere, and so there's some inherent risks in that, and how your data might actually be used. And the more of it that's, that's automated, the less of that is really in your control. Um, so. I think it can often be a goal to try to automate, but I do think that there are some both individual and societal downsides to it. Does that start to answer your question? Uh, yeah, I'd like to hear more about the downsides. Do you have specific things in your head? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the two the two that I said was uh, uh, less reflection. You know, you you spend less time with that data. It might be useful for record keeping, but you spend less time kind of internalizing that data. Um, and then how it might be used by other businesses, other companies, that sort of thing. I'm happy to, to talk about this more online as well. Go ahead. Uh, one question, I reflect on my own uh, personal uh, tracking uh, experience, for example, if I do like food journaling mm -hmm. or like exercise tracking, mm -hmm. I'm maybe more likely to track when my behaviors are aligned with my goal. Uh -huh. So I'm thinking uh, how to address it, how to motivate people to track more when they're actually doing bad on their goals. How do you motivate people to track more when they're doing bad on their goals? Um, I mean, cynically, one thing that I'd say is maybe you shouldn't. Right, like if if all you're going to see is, um, you know, you're just going to feel bad about the data that's coming in, then then maybe you know maybe at a macro level that's not good for your personal health to do that. Um, I mean, in terms of like if you think about it in the in the kind of goal setting, goal monitoring space, um, I think the other thing um, that interventions have done and have thought about, um, I haven't done quite as much of this in my work. Um, but trying to highlight other values rather than kind of your absolute performance on a metric, for example. So it may not be, you know, you may have whatever exceeded your calorie goal, for example, but, you know, maybe, maybe you did better than most people are doing over a holiday season or something. So you can do some sort of like externalization or maybe, you know, maybe you did well relative to yourself you know, two months ago, two weeks ago, something like that. And so there may be other, uh, you know, whatever, quote unquote victory, or quote unquote, like ways that you can kind of conceptualize uh, what success is defined as that aren't just like the performance on this, you know, kind of absolute measure. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Danny, like for this great talk. I really appreciate that. So one question I have is, about the personal personal personalization. Uh -huh. uh, so I think like uh, a lot of like your talks and your words like are relevant to the presentation presentation like mm -hmm. based on the individual's needs. Yep. And I can see like personalization like happening in two different dimensions. One is like people may have dynamic changes, like dynamic tracking goals yep, over yep. time. And also like if you're giving people like multiple uh, threads of data, they may only focus on like one data point, like the set cost yeah. or like heart rate. Uh -huh. So like you also uh, like talk about like the artifacts, like we should like create artifacts to promote those conversations with the individuals. Mm -hmm. So how you see like this two dimensions, like, you know, impact the design work and what might be the, you know, some opportunities related to that? Because I think this can make things super like complicated. I have like different tracking goals over time. I'm yeah. looking at different data points. Yeah. So I think I think one of the key pieces there, um, and admittedly, this this gets hard in research settings when you're designing one piece of tracking tracking technology at a time typically. Um is viewing tracking and, and the goals of tracking and that sort of thing as as like a larger technology ecosystem. Um, you're not the goal isn't necessarily to lock people into one particular app or one particular device for a period of time, but kind of, but to kind of 
build ecosystems in a way such that they can kind of switch between them. Um, and so we did a project on how people go about selecting apps, for example, that I didn't get to talk about here. Um, but one of the big things that happened there was that people would download like five or six apps at a time and then kind of try out each of them to see whether or not they were kind of effective at supporting you know, their particular target goals at the moment. And then they would keep that in the back of their mind as they use the app and kind of switch or, or you know, use multiple at once if that would then benefit. So I think I think that's probably the biggest thing is like let's not try to design the like one you know tracking tool that's going to be the most effective one, mm -hmm. um, but let's if we can give people better tools for navigating the ecosystem of things that are available to them. Mm -hmm. And does that mean like some happy abandoned would also be considered like reasonable? Oh, because I mean, I'm using like multiple app and I can like abandon one app. Yeah, and that that's being fine. Yeah, I would hope so. Um, and then, I don't know, I'd like to think that ideally it would be there if you need it again. I'm going to take one question from Zoom, and then I saw you had your hand up. Um, Sumi asks, the snappy example is very interesting for sharing and annotating data. Have you thought about contextual data animation and annotation as a more accurate way uh, to get data and to develop intelligent solutions that data that's labeled ad hoc outside of the collection, outside of the context that it's collected in? Uh, yes, that's that's a good question. Um, so I'm not sure how much of this came up in, in what we were doing in Snappy. We kind of pulled data from a couple of external data sources. So Step data came from, from Apple Health and HealthKit. Um, the music data came straight from Spotify. So we were pulling some data from some pieces of context, um, at least in that case. Um, but I'd love to hear, and, and going around the room earlier, it sounds like some people have uh, have a background in, in kind of pulling data from these sort of external sources. Um, I'd love to hear more about what, what sort of contextual information might end up being useful in that space. Because um, I, yeah, I, I've, I've often, well, for one, I've often focused most of my work on health and well-being settings. So things like, you know, music or browsing history or that sort of stuff isn't as, uh, as much in my forefront. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear more about what sorts of context might be interesting to pull in. Go ahead. Um, my question is not well formulated. That's this fine. was really interesting, and I'm trying to apply it to a different situation. Yeah. So it's, um, I'm part of a group that is trying to give equity data to instructors to help them see gaps in their classes. Cool. And I love the idea of allowing people to customize their own summaries. Yeah. While at the same time, I struggle with whether people could adequately voice what the issues might be. And I've wondered about when people allow people to customize summaries, whether it's more of a like, I can't, I have these values, and now the tool knows to map that onto particular types of summaries of data versus it's people saying, I want to see a graph of X versus Y. Yeah, uh, good question. So, okay, I'm gonna go in a couple of different directions with this. One, um, I'm not sure how viable it is for a system to decide for me what values I have, meaning like I wouldn't want to turn it over to Fitbit to decide what watch face that I want, right? Like, I mean, I guess maybe I could see like something where it's trying to pull photos, for example, and you know, it sees a photo of, you know, my kid or some nature or something, and then it like slaps that on the back of my watch face. Like I could, I could potentially see something in that space. Uh, I'll, I'll get to you in just a sec. Um, but but I'm not sure how much I would I would trust the system to make that sort of decision. Um, your domain is also interesting because I think I think there's potential and, and you you know more about this than I do. But I think there's potentially different stakeholders involved in that. Like the I, I don't want to say the institution, but let's say the institution has things that they want to convey to me. It's not just about me for my own personal understanding and my own personal value, but the the institution has goals that it wants me to capture. And I think maybe maybe this goes back to your question. Maybe this is this is also where you were thinking. Uh, but a a company or an institution that is aimed at promoting my well-being might similarly want to promote those same sorts of like might might want to like push those same sorts of goals, those same sorts of data, that sort of thing on me for my own reflection. And I guess. What I'm saying is that there's some amount of give and take there, right? Like there's some amount of like, yeah, that's great. You know, if seeing my step data is what's helpful for, you know, making me be more active, making whatever, uh, some amount of that is good. 
maybe there's also some amount of ability for me to kind of dig into myself and present it in a way that I find personally useful. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, um, you know, you might know the Odysseus type of the sale metaphor of like where you decide on your values, this is what I want, and then you have your crew tie you to the sale so that even if the sirens call, you can't go and eat that piece of chocolate cake. Um, and uh, I was thinking people are famously bad at losing weight, say, and um, they might list losing weight as high of one of their top values, yeah. but when they get stressed, they'll eat, or when, when they're not thinking about it, they'll consume the entire bag of chips instead of half. And, um, that sort of uh, like letting the app decide uh, your values for you is something that I think that you automatically do when you choose to download and use the app. And that therefore you've already given your consent uh, to the app to help you secure this value for you. And that after that, it using automated data collection and uh, rehearsement of the data at points that it finds in a manipulative way even, would be still, for example, more ethical than Facebook holding back your notifications until just the time you're about to get off, which they already do. So there's a lot of automation already being used uh, in this way to manipulate people's behaviors because they don't have to control themselves. Like I don't. Um, and a lot of the uh, industry use of it is already fairly unethical. So I mean, for a device to attempt to manipulate you using uh, hard data in order to make it towards a value that you've already consented to say you want uh, seems to me to be not a negative, but like rather a positive. So I'll push back slightly in that in, you know, you, you may go and you may look up a food journaling app. You, you, it, it may be the case that in downloading that app, you have an idea of what sort of values that you want, that you, that you want to lose weight per se, that you want to uh, monitor what you're what you're eating for for larger awareness goals. You may also not. You may go into a domain thinking like, huh, I kind of want to track my food. I don't exactly know which among the slate of goals it's going to be most useful for. I'm going to you know derive the most value from it. Um, and then and then the risk is that the app is then locking you in, right? Like the app is then pushing your values. And what we find in practice is that like people people then switch around. People then. Uh, you know, they make that inherent judgment of whether or not the app is is kind of supporting that the a, a set of goals that they desire, um, and they might switch otherwise. Um, but it, it it may not be as like like people are not necessarily as intentional at the point that they're going and they're deciding to use that. Um, to give one more example, and then I know where we we got to end for time. People get devices as gifts. Um, you know, people get devices from their institutions, right? Like you you go when. Your university buys you a Fitbit and tells you that you should run around more. You don't necessarily have a goal for that. The institution has a goal that is kind of trying to push on you, um, but you're you're not necessarily having that set of values going into that direction. I think we're at time, so I think I'm going to wrap up there. But yeah, thank you all for coming. Um, my email is not on the slide. My email is on this slide. If you want to talk to me more?